evening and thank you for applauding because after that long line outside, it's really good to know that you're still in a good enough mood to be, to be glad you're here. So thank you. And we do apologize. We'll do better next week, I promise. We will definitely do better next week. Thank you for your patience. I am delighted to welcome you to this 13th annual Straight Talk series presented by the Riley Institute and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Furman. This highly valued partnership and annual series began in 2011 when we looked at civil rights in South Carolina and over the years we have examined issues such as health care policy, immigration, crime and punishment, and climate change. Thank you for being with us tonight as we begin our 2023 three-part series on our fragile democracy. This year's series builds on previous Straight Talk series. Six years ago, in 2017, we presented media and politics in a post-truth era. At the time, we hoped that the environment of misinformation and propaganda would recede. On the contrary, we have seen the province of alternative facts expand and it is a strong contributor to our poli current political divide. And then in 2020, despite the COVID pandemic, we continued the Straight Talk series using everyone's favorite platform, Zoom, to look at voting in America. That year, we went so far as to ask the question of political reporter Robert Costa, what is your nightmare scenario for the 2020 election? To which he responded, if one of our nominees doesn't accept the result, what will happen? So now in 2023, we find ourselves knowing what did happen when one of the nominees did not accept the result and wondering what will come next for democracy in America. You likely noticed the students who were greeting you and handing out programs. These amazing young people are members of the Riley Institute Advance Team when we began planning for this series, I asked these students what they viewed as the greatest threats to our democracy. Among the answers they gave were polarization, extremism, misinformation and disinformation, a lack of trust in government institutions, all of which are true. And I think many of us in this room, whether you're OLLI members or students or from the Greenville community, are already aware at some level about the influences that are weakening democracy in America. And perhaps, if you're like me, you're wondering, is it really possible that America's democracy, the world's oldest democracy, could fail? A difficult place to be. And so we begin our series tonight by looking at where American democracy has faltered in the past and yet survived and where we find ourselves today, nearly three years after the attack on the Capitol on January 6, 2021, and approaching an election where the likely Republican nominee has been indicted for conspiring to defraud the United States and prevent the peaceful transfer of presidential power. Next week, we will zero in on the cornerstone of any democracy, free and fair elections, and evaluate where we are today in election security, election integrity, and public trust in elections. And then finally, during our third and final session on September 12th, we will hear from a scholar whose research focuses on what democracy means to Americans and from two political and community building leaders, one a Republican and one a Democrat, as they share their insights into what we can do to improve our democratic processes and what we need from our leaders and ordinary citizens as we seek to reform our democracy. I need to say this. I hope everyone in the room tonight understands a key tenet of this series. As has been our habit each year, we do not approach this year's straight talk topic with a partisan lens. While individuals on stage may possess a liberal or conservative perspective, what they are bringing to this discussion is information and evidence that they are uniquely positioned to present. The Riley Institute and Ollie are not interested in advancing a political agenda. Rather, we focus on facts, evidence, and an informed approach to drawing conclusions based on that evidence and those facts. So, our speakers tonight are a perfect example of this. We are delighted to have with us two Furman graduates, Admiral Mike McConnell from the class of 1966 and Timadayo Aganga-Williams, the class of 2008. 
Admiral McConnell, who had a 29-year naval career, served as the intelligence officer for Joint Chiefs of Staff Colin Powell and then Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney. He was the director of the National Security Agency. Many of you think of it as the NSA. And he was director of national intelligence. And he served under both Republican and Democratic presidents in these capacities. As the Director of National Intelligence, he led the 18 agencies and organizations that make up the intelligence community. So think CIA, FBI, NSA, Army, Air Force, Marine, and Naval Intelligence. And even though he no longer has an official position in the federal government, his advice is still sought by the leaders of the intelligence community as they work to protect our national security. Thus, he brings with him tonight expertise and experience beyond what any of us mere mortals might presume to possess. He brings a historical lens, a military intelligence lens, and a national security lens to evaluating the very real threat putting our country's constitutional system of government at risk. And then later in the program, we're going to hear from Timidayo Aganga Williams, who can tell us the details of what happened on January 6, 2021. That day, for the first time in our country's 247-year history, the peaceful transfer of power was attacked. As the senior investigative counsel for the House Committee to investigate January 6, Mr. Aganga Williams conducted dozens of interviews of people involved in the activities of that day, including senior members of the Trump administration. The lens he brings is that of a legal expert who examined all of the evidence and testimony surrounding January 6. His perspective is grounded in facts, evidence, and the law. I'm really looking forward to hearing what both of them have to say. To help us make sense of what is happening and what it means, Dr. Daniel Vinson, who is also a graduate of Furman University, will be our moderator tonight and throughout the series. Dr. Vinson is a professor of political science whose specialty is in institutions in American government. She has a PhD from Duke University. And as she moderates each evening's discussion, she will bring her signature combination of brilliance, candor, humor, and disarming kindness. One more thing to note before I invite Admiral McConnell to the stage. Each evening, we will give you the chance to ask questions. So please be sure to go ahead and use the QR code on your program or up here on the screen so that you can be ready to submit your questions. We thank Dr. Bouquet Ostas, our faculty member, sorting through your questions, and our two Riley Institute Advanced Team students, Emerson and Blake, who will come and ask the questions of our speakers. At this time, please join me in welcoming to the stage Admiral Mike McConnell. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jill, for that very kind introduction. Let me translate what Jill said. We got an old guy up here who's back again. <laughs> 57 years ago, I left this wonderful, wonderful institution. <clears throat> uh, pretty serious topic tonight. I have a few things to share, but I got to start with a story. I have a friend in the audience somewhere. His name is Neil Cochran. Neil, would, would you stand up? Neil and I went to high school together. We went to junior college together. We graduated from Furman. He's a, a Baptist minister. Now, the reason I want to uh, identify Neil is I want, he's the victim of my story. Um, Neil has uh, married us and buried us, and he'll be probably around to... Uh, attend my funeral, but I'm refusing to go that so far. But anyway, um, I have a granddaughter, and Neil's a wonderful preacher, and I was in the Navy, of course, always gone. Occasionally, I'd come home. So I came home. It was around Easter. So well, let's go to Preacher Neil's service. So we did, and he was preaching leading up to Easter, and he started to talk about the resurrection. And Neil had a talent for trapping Baptists in the room. He caused all the children to sit down on the first two rows. And that kept them from sneaking out the back door, the parents out the back door. So he's rolling along with his sermon, and he said, let's talk to the children. He said, children, who among you can tell us what is the resurrection? 
And my daughter, granddaughter, jumped up, took the microphone, looked at the audience and said, Preacher Neil, I don't know what the resurrection is, but I know if you get one that lasts more four hours, you better call a doctor. It was all that Preacher Neil could do to keep that audience uh, settled back in their seats. Okay, Navy for 30 years, business for 14 or so, back in as serves the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, and this microphone's squeaking just a bit, so maybe you all could make an adjustment, that'd be great. Um, DNI, Director of National Intelligence, uh, principal customer, President Bush, he wanted to be briefed six, six days a week, sometimes seven. So that meant for me up at four, hope to get to bed by midnight. It wasn't so mentally challenging. It was physically challenging, but it was great. I, uh, I enjoyed it. Back to business. I did serve briefly as a, the executive director of something called Cyber Florida, which is uh, focused on cybersecurity education and uh, research and outreach, and it's something I really enjoyed because I've focused on cybersecurity for a long time. What about me? I'm an independent. My family, unlike most uh, families in South Carolina, were intensely liberal. So what I heard in the home and what I heard outside were vastly different. So I decided early on I, I'm going to be an independent, and then as an independent, I voted for Republicans and I voted for Democrats. My position is I vote for who I think is the best person for the time for the country. So that's kind of my background. As a military officer, you have to be apolitical. I've served uh, Republican presidents and Democratic presidents and did it well. We take an oath in the U.S. military and the U.S. government to the Constitution. The British swear allegiance to the king or queen, whatever, whoever's in power. But in the United States, you swear an oath to the Constitution, uphold and defend the Constitution. And that what that means is whoever's in office, you're going to have to respond to the guidance and uh, proceed accordingly. The best thing that happened to the people in this room and the people in the United States is called the U.S. Constitution. The Bill of Rights and the amendments came with the Constitution, primarily the First Amendment, unprecedented in history. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, right to petition your government, and the Congress could make no law on how to regulate those freedoms. The Constitution set up the rule of law, separation of powers, checks and balances. Now think of the timing. When the framers framed, we're all farmers. 90% of the country was probably even higher, were, were farmers. And the rest of the world was ruled by a strong person, king, monarch, a dictator, a czar. No czar left office by natural death for the last 200 years of the Russian Empire. The point I'm making is absolute power. As the Englishman said, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so once in power, they would eliminate other contenders, surround themselves with yes men, and no checks and balances. So this is the framing for the founders in that period of time. We're all farmers. We don't want to be like those others. How do we do it? So they came up with a system of checks and balances. Three branches of government, not one. A legislature power of the purse. My, when I was in the military, all my compatriots said, oh, we hate Congress. They're trying to get in our business, trying to tell us what to do. I said, wait a minute. They got the money. I want to make friends over there on the hill. They have not only the power of the purse, they appropriate the money, but they also can tell you how to spend it. They have oversight. They have authorization authority. So, three branches, legislature, they have the money and they can tell you how to spend it. Legis the executive branch, which we, you know, see every day on TV, follow the president around the world. He runs the administration, he serves as the commander-in-chief, and then the judicial system. The judicial system um, 
rules on adherence to the Constitution and the laws that the country has made. Due to the First Amendment that I mentioned earlier, many of us, myself included, we use, view the news media as the fourth estate of government to keep our citizens informed. Now, news media has evolved. It's very different today. And there's left, and there's sort of what used to be, and then there's extreme right. That, they didn't have that in the days of the founders. I want to, I'm not going to read anything, but this short little item I brought along. I found it when I was thinking about this, this comment. And it, the title is, the, the Founders Anticipated Threat of a Demagogue. The indictment of the former president outlines the sort of demographic challenge to the rule of law that the, that the Constitution's architects feared. A few and key concern of James Madison and Alexander Hamilton was that demagogues would incite mobs and factions to defy the rule of law, overturn free and fair elections, and undermine democracy. Hamilton speaking, writing in the Federalist Papers. The only path to a subversion of the republic system is by flattering the prejudice of, prejudices of the people and exciting the jealousies and apprehensions to throw affairs into confusion and bring on civil commotion. Alexander, 1790. When a man unprincipled in private life, desperate in his fortune, bold in his temper, is seen to mount the hobby horse of popularity, Hamilton warned, he may ride the storm and direct the whirlwind. Just a bit more here. The founders designed a constitutional system to prevent demagogues from sowing confusion and mob violence in precisely this way. The vast extent of the country, this is Madison, would make it hard for local factions to coordinate any kind of mass mobilization. This was, of course, before 24-hour news and, and social media. Madison continued, the horizontal separation of powers among the three branches of government would ensure that the House impeached and the Senate convicted corrupt presidents. The vertical division of powers between the states and the federal government would ensure that local officials ensured election integrity. Just one more verse. The norms about the peaceful transfer of power were strengthened by George Washington as a towering example of voluntarily stepping down after two terms, never before in the history of the world. This served to ensure that no electric president could convert himself, like Caesar, to an unelect, unelected dictator. The idea of introducing a monarchy or aristocracy into the company, Hamilton wrote, is one of those visionary things that none but madmen would meditate. As long as the American people resisted convulsions and disorders and the consequences of the acts of popular demagogues. That is background. Who is, in my view, the four greatest presidents? I'm going to surprise you to think, to hear, I think, of the, th of the four, three of them are Republicans, or would be in today's terminology Republican. First is Washington. And one of his greatest achievements was stepping down. Napoleon was advised once to step down after he came back to the throne. And his response was, who do you think I am, George Washington? <laughs> Lincoln, a Republican. He saved the Union. Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, known as the trust buster. Franklin Delano Roosevelt saved the country from economic ruin. Each, each of those presidents deserves lots of study, full semesters, and um, review and study to do it justice. I'm going to say just a couple words about each. Washington was, a, was associated with the Cincinnatus Club. The Cincinnatus Club was a group of officers who wanted a British system of inheritance. You pass down your wealth and your title and so on based on your family, not based on merit. Um, Washington had no natural heirs. All of his children were stepchildren. That's one of the reasons that they went, went ahead with making him the, electing him as the first president. He stepped down as the leader of the nation, setting a precedent first ever. Lincoln, the Civil War was to preserve slavery, period. 
only four presidents had not owned slaves up to, uh, during this time. John Adams, John Quincy Adams, his son, Millard Fillmore, and Abraham Lincoln. In my view, the assassination of Lincoln prevented the reconstruction of the South. His vice president, and Andrew Johnson, sympathetic to the South, had owned slaves, but when he did not engage in reconstruction, that led to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, restriction of voting rights, and it enhanced attitudes about racism. It led to Jim Crow that made some of our citizens not enjoy freedom and voting rights. I believe what I've just said about the, our history sets the stage for t today's issues. And here's what I'm going to say that will be controversial. But I've thought about it for 80 years. Yes, I'm 80 years old. And contrary to popular belief, I wasn't around when Lincoln was fighting the Civil War. But anyway, <laughs> privileged white majority perceives threats to their position, their position of privilege. They fear becoming another minority as other minorities in the country increase in number. I believe a recent president gave voice exactly to those concerns. <laughs> I've got the speed here because I only have a few minutes, but I'm going to run through these points. Moves to restrict voting rights for minorities against all immigration of any kind, bringing manufacturing jobs back to the country that left due to globalization, denial of climate change. That hit an element of our society and somebody was speaking to them. Now, I believe some of those elements of our society have legitimate claims. I believe the nation failed that element when glo globalization started and jobs started to leave. Greenville, South Carolina is a great example. Textile center of the world when I was a child. It's all gone. Greenville's prospering. What did they do? New industry, new training. We failed as a nation to retrain and prepare our citizens for the information age. So there's a legitimate claim there. I want to talk to you just for a second about demographics. When I was the DNI, being DNI is great. You got a question, you just ask some smart people, PhDs, they go off and study it, and they bring back an answer. So I said, uh, I want to look at global demographics. Here's the answer. China, Japan, Russia, and Europe are going over a cliff. Now let me explain that in graphic terms. Most societies are like this. Us old guys are at the top, and the young workers are down here. Well, when your demographics are such that women of childbearing age only have one, 1 1.2, 1.3 children, that pyramid inverses. And now you got a few people working and making things, and all those old guys are up here hoping that they'll support us. That's happening to China, Japan, Russia, and Europe. Two nations were okay. India, birth rate, they sustained their population, they're growing. And the U.S., well, that's surprising. Birth rate in the U.S. has gone down below what it takes to sustain a population. It takes 2.1 to sustain population. Our birth rate now is below that. Well, how are we doing okay? Immigration. Now, here's something that most people are totally unaware of. Your workforce has to continue to grow for prosperity. The U.S. workforce grew in the last two years for one reason, immigrants. So if you think about smart people good ideas, come to a place where they can invest and be creative. you got workers who want to work. Why isn't that good for America? Just one old guy's perspective on this. We need to reform our immigration laws. While I was in the White House, I wasn't involved, but I sat there in the Oval listening to President Bush attempting to reform immigration laws. Uh, he was shot down by the U.S. Senate. In my view, the perception was we have to protect the white majority that's in this country and not allow extensive immigration. It's a balance in there somewhere. 
One recommendation for you. Ken Burns, one of my favorite producers of wonderful documentaries. He did something called The Intimate View of the Roosevelts. It's a PBS documentary, and I'd encourage you to get it. You can watch it online or you can buy it. I have 10 minutes to go, and I'm speeding along. Thank you, ma'am. Teddy Roosevelt was rich. He was a Republican. He was an aristocrat, maybe even someone arrogant, some would say. But he had this strong, compelling desire to take care of citizens. Now, monopolies, we became the world's largest economy in the late 1800s. Monopolies had seized power. And when you're a monopoly, you dictate. You tell the public what they're going to pay. You determine wages. And so monopolies were causing great harm to the country. So Teddy Roosevelt took them on, trust buster. He didn't break up many of them, but he started us down a path. The Republicans hated their Republican president, but he put us on a path to break monopoly power, reform labor laws, and start to protect workers and children. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, deep depression. When I say deep, I mean absolutely strangling depression. Over 25% of the people in the United States are unemployed. It's probably higher than that. That's what they documented. People were going hungry. You had people close to starvation. World War I veterans were marching on Washington. When they volunteered, went to Europe, helped win World War I, they said, we will give you a bonus when you come home. They didn't pay the bonus. So they got organized. They marched on Washington carrying guns, and they were demanding their bonuses. We were under the threat of anarchy. President Herbert Hoover, first part of the Depression, said, I've got to do things to bring the country back. And the recommendation was tariffs, putting tariffs on everything. Well, that, well, wait a minute, think about that. Put tariffs on everything coming in. That makes it more expensive for us and oh, by the way, what is the other country going to do? It's called tariff retaliation. The, the result of Herbert Hoover's tariffs, that it deepened the depression, not only in the United States, the world's largest economy, but globally. It was absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Banks were failing. Now, I learned this right here at Furman University. I was an economics major. Economics 101, banking. The money's not there. Now you think about it. Uh, we all put in our money. What does the bank do? They loan it out. Well, now, if you and I say, wait a minute, we don't, we're worried about that bank. Let's go down and get our money. It's not there. So if everybody wants it, bank fails. So banks were failing all over the country. So Roosevelt said, bank holiday, I'm freezing everything. The political uproar was deafening. What he said was, Mr. Secretary of the Treasury, you deliver several billion dollars in cash to the banks all over the country. What happened? Withdrawals started to go back. Deposits went up because all of a sudden people said, wait a minute, somebody's listening. Somebody's trying to help us out. Under great political opposition, most of the things that Franklin Roosevelt tried to do were pushed back. The claim was he's leading us directly to communism. All right, what did he do? Hunt New Deal, first 100 days, WPA. Most people probably never even heard of the WPA. Workers Projects Administration. He put people to work. Blue Ridge Parkway that many people here have enjoyed, they built that. And then it went all the way to Virginia with Skyline Drive. They built TVA, post offices, federal buildings, just put people to work. You know what the pay was? The worker got $25, but he had to send $20 home. He could live on $5. But it worked. People had hope. They started to believe. Massive investments in the infrastructure. Social Security. Everybody on the conservative side was against it. Ask them today. Most, wherever you are politically, most will defend Social Security Day. But boy, it was a big deal back in the 30s. Social safety net, just a meager, meager amount of money that would take care of people in, in their old age. 
And that took World War II to actually really pull us out of that Great Depression. Uh, FDR died before the final victory. But when the U.S. emerged from World War II, we were the global leader. Created the United Nations, the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, NATO. It was an incredible accomplishment. Truman, vice president, re-elected as president, approved the Marshall Plan. In World War I, Britain and uh, France put incredible burden on Germany because they'd started a war. It led to the rise of Hitler, and we're back in World War II. So informed by that, they said, well, let's, let's rebuild Germany and Japan and some of the others. And they did, and they became prosper nation, prosperous nations. If you look at economies, they're in the top four, uh, and they're democratic, and they're great allies. One of them's a member of NALO. So the things that we learned and what emerged out of that were incredible. Last president I will talk about in my historical list is Richard Nixon. Paranoid, way ahead in the polls, going to win the election, but he just was paranoid. So he used my community, particularly the FBI, but also the CIA, NSA, Army Intelligence. You get out there and collect on these Americans that might be opposed to me. And said, oh, by the way, let's break into the Democratic headquarters. This looks from dirt we can, we can publish and cause them to be even less in favor. Well, that's bad enough, but he got caught, and then he lied about it. He put himself above the law. So he was on a path to be impeached by the House and to be convicted by the Senate. And rather than do that, he chose to step down, and he did. Brings me to today. Former president lied about losing the election. He tried to stop a peaceful transfer of power. All of those claims that have been examined were without merit. His attorney general said, there is no evidence. You lost the election. He continued to lie. He pressured his vice president to not clarify the election results. He pressured other officials to find votes. He created false electors. And there are many people who have an opinion on what happened on the 6th of January, 2021. In this observer's view, that was an insurrection. And by the 14th Amendment, if you're guilty of insurrection, that makes you ineligible for public office. So. Okay. Now is the time for accountability What's going to happen now is on the third branch of our government, of our checks and balances, it will be played out in court. And hopefully, in the words of Hamilton and Madison, keeping a demag demagogue from seizing power. That man gave voice to a broad cross-cut of white voters, some with legitimate grievances, over losing their position of power over minorities. This is the greatest threat today to, a, to a democracy. I have a final comment. Dictators and demagogues. I'll, mix, I'll just say some names and you will recognize. Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Putin. Millions, millions of people died because one man had unchecked power. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Admiral McConnell, for reminding us of the importance of, that presidents play in our democracy, historically, currently. Um, Admiral McConnell has taken his seat on the stage. I invite Timideo Agenga Williams to join us on the stage. As he does so, please remember to submit your questions. You can use the QR code in front, on the front of your program, or you can scan the code on the screen. I hope while we're waiting for everybody to get positioned, that you saw the displays in the lobby as you were coming in. 
um, and particularly the media bias chart. It's an interesting snapshot of where the information we receive lies on the fact, opinion, analysis, falsehood, partisan spectrum. Stop by on the way out and find where your favorite media source fits if you didn't do so on your way in. And as I tell my students frequently, please remember to get a balanced media diet. You need a variety of sources. If all of your sources are on the right or on the left, you are missing key facts and an opportunity to understand your fellow citizens. As Jill mentioned earlier, at Furman and throughout the Straight Talk series, we present data, facts, and evidence. And then we allow our scholars and our practitioners to offer some perspectives on how best to interpret these facts. We're fortunate to have tonight with us Timodeo Aganga-Williams, someone who understands the facts surrounding what happened on January 6, 2021, probably better than most. Timodeo, we just heard from Admiral McConnell what he's observed as a top-level advisor to the national intelligence community about the threats facing our democracy. You've had a front row seat to the investigation of the events on January 6. Take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about what you investigated in your role as a senior counsel to the January 6 committee in Congress, uh, the people that you interviewed, and what you learned uh, in the course of that investigation. Well, first of all, uh, very happy to be here, and, and, and thank you to, the, uh, to Furman for having me. Uh, so my role as a senior investigative counsel, prior to that role, I was federal prosecutor, and I'm a litigator by training as a lawyer. And what we do is we investigate. That's what litigators do. You find facts. You understand what happens, the who, what, where, and when. And the role that uh, folks in my position played in our teams was to investigate, investigate not only what happened the day of, but more so what happened in the month prior, the time preceding the attack and the rally that was before the attack. And as part of that process, we uh, looked at everything from uh, folks in the Trump campaign, uh, the Trump White House advisors, the broader Republican Party. We really talked to uh, a wide array of, frankly, Republicans. And I think that's a critical component of our fact investigation. Our facts came from people who were within the Trump orbit. I, I really cannot think of any Democrats who were actually truly key witnesses in our investigation. When you think about the folks from uh, DOJ to state officials all across the board, there are people who were uh, on the right, which I think is important because as a lawyer, we think about credibility and whether people who are providing evidence have a reason to mislead. And what we looked at was to explain who uh, was to blame and uh, what individuals or entities as to what happened on the 6th. And what we were not focused on, frankly, was the violence on the 6th. And by that, I mean the Department of Justice immediately after uh, the attack did a very good job of going after the people who were there. Hundreds of people have been charged and convicted, and those cases are working their, their way through, uh, through our system. But we weren't for there for that part. What we were there was to consider the political coup, the attempts to use uh, nonviolent means that all preceded what happened on the day of. And you know, our results are public, which I think is an important thing that we have this conversation today, is that pretty much anything you're going to ask me just about, you can go online and look for yourself. Our report is online, our hearings were public, deposition transcripts are online, documents are online. This is, you know, I think, arguably the most important investigation uh, in American history, and it is all online. It is all publicly available to anyone who wants to fact check and find out things for themselves. But I think the most important lesson of what we uncovered was that they, there was a organized, concerted plan that was led by former President Trump to unlawfully overturn the election results. And just to explain what that means from our perspective, when we started this investigation, we did not come in with an idea of how do we get Trump. This committee was completely bipartisan. It, you had folks on there who would not agree on anything under the sun except for protect America, <laughs> protect this country, protect America, protect democracy. And after that, I mean, we would have discussions and folks, there was nothing else that folks agreed on. Um, but what our results, our investigation concluded was that 
former President Trump led a plan and led it personally um, to uh, overturn the election results that he knew that he had lost, that he acknowledged privately that he had lost, and that he, uh, that he was told by all his advisors that he had lost, including the day of, of the election. When he went out there and claimed that, that he had won, he was told that he shouldn't say that, and there was no evidence for that. Um, and so what we found was over those months, there was what you would, I think I would call a political, attempted political coup. He tried to uh, use the Department of Justice. He tried to pressure state officials. He tried to go to state legislators. He repeatedly stated again and again that the election was stolen when he knew that not to be true. He stated that 5,000 people, dead people voted in Georgia. He knew that was not true. He, he talked about the suitcase full of ballots uh, also in Fulton County, he knew that was not true. He was told that the elector scheme that he's now been charged with was illegal. He wanted to move forward. He was told that Vice President Pence didn't have the authority to overturn election results. He nonetheless pressured Vice President Pence. So I think when we put all that together, I think the, one of the things I want people to take away is that we often focus on the violence of January 6th. But what our investigation found is that there was uh, there was like an, a political attack that happened in the month prior. And when we get to January 6th, that explosion of violence, which we can talk more about, that is almost, uh, I would never call it a footnote, but it's, it, it's burst out of this, but there's an entire effort that was unlawful, illegal, uh, that all happened that would have been an attack on the country if no violence had happened that day at all. Given what you learned in your investigation, how close did we come to losing democracy that day and not having a peaceful transfer of power? You know, I think it's hard to explain. I, I think a lot of people do not fully appreciate that uh, our, one of our branches of government was standing afterwards by, by chance, but not by plan. Uh, you've seen some of the video, you know, for example, there's video of, of uh, Mitt Romney and he is, almost comes fully uh, in line with the mob and an, uh, a Capitol Police officer gets him away just you know, in seconds. You've seen the video of a Capitol Police officer who has the, the, you know, the Senate is basically unguarded because they were massively unprepared for the violence uh, that could happen that day even though law enforcement was warned and people in law enforcement had, had raised red flags. But there's one officer who's leading the entire crowd and he shoves one of the uh, the insurrectionist in the chest and moves him and they, they all follow him and they're leaving a door, uh, they leave a door, but it's an unguarded door with senators inside. Um, Ashley Babbitt has become a folk hero on the right, um, but I think just to, you know, I, I went to go stand where exactly where she was shot. And what folks have to realize is that when the glass that she's trying to break down and climb in through, I mean, the amount of distance between me and that podium is more distance than would have been within her hopping in and getting in a door into the members of Congress. And while they are going, they, are, they have a thirst for blood, right? You've seen the violence, and I think there's been an attempt to claim that there was not violence or this was, a, this was peaceful, it was a protest. It was not a protest. Again, this is all online. You can go and watch all of this. Um, and when she's shot the, uh, in the chest, uh, ultimately dies in the Capitol, that crowd does disperse. And it gives those officers additional time to protect the members of Congress and to get them out of that space. Right, so people can have their views, but I think the use of violence there arguably saved members of Congress' lives. Um, and because the crowd dispersed um, at, at that point. Admiral McConnell, you noted in your speech that Former Trump, former President Trump is the greatest threat to our democracy. We know that January 6th was a watershed moment for our country. I think many of us were watching as it happened. Um, there are a lot of people who have already been sent to jail because of their role in January 6th. We've certainly got indictments now um, of, for a number of the political officials who uh, were, were involved in the weeks leading up to that. Um, do you believe our democracy is under greater or less threat now, two and a half years removed from January 6th, than we were on that day 
um, or is there still a danger? So the question is, are we safer today? Yes, are we safer today? When I was the director of national intelligence, I always got the question with regard to terrorism, are we safer? My answer was always, yes, but. So I'm going to give you the same answer, yes, but. What I tried to capture in my remarks, I think what President Trump did that was somewhat unique is he, gap, he captured a feeling in the country of social discontent from a vast crosscut of society. And he gave voice to that group of people. And it has made them more bold, and now there are news sources that feed that idea. So I think, yes, we're safer, but my real concern is what happens to this crosscut of people who are against immigration, they tend to be racist, they're trying to restrict voting rights, they're trying to do things to the country that would take us back to Jim Crow, which was so prevalent here in the South. And I think that is fundamentally wrong. And if, it, if we go that way, the other side's gonna push back. We had violence in the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, it fortunately didn't spin out of control, but we have the elements in society now for violence. And that's why I'd say safer, because we have indictments and it's going to the courts and we have a process, safer. But what about this group across the country that has been given voice and they believe it's a little bit like faith. Uh, growing up, I was always questioning my pastor friend, Neil. Well, Neil, how do you know? He said, got to have faith. Well, well, wait a minute. I want facts. I'm more like Timideo. <laughs> give, me, give me the facts. So uh, that's the group I worry about. Timidea, I want to ask you the same question. You talked to a lot of folks that were involved in January 6th face-to-face. -face. You heard what a lot of politicians and public officials are saying in Washington and around the country. Uh, is our democracy safer now than it was on January 6th? Um, I would say no. I, I, I don't think it's safer. I think, I think American democracy is like a, it's almost like being sick. And we now have a diagnosis, but I think it's, it's TBD on, on what the outcome is. And, and I think I'm, you know, we'll talk about things later that make, you know, might make me hopeful, but I think, I think one of the lessons from my experience on the committee is for people to realize how baseless what happened was. And by that I mean, and I know there's political disagreement or we all come from our political presumptions, what the committee found is that there, there was no evidence of widespread fraud that impacted the election. And I think that fact is critical in how we judge the former president's actions, right? There's this idea that I think that he genuinely believed that. It's not supported by any evidence. The fraud he talks about is not supported by any evidence. And to, for, to those who hear that, and that may feel like jarring to the ear, I would just say, look up what he said, what evidence he has put out. Former President Trump recently said he was gonna hold a press conference to refute the Georgia allegations. Then he canceled the press conference. Then he said he had a report that would show all the fraud, which is astonishing, because it's been two and a half years since the attack. You would think if he had a report, he would have released it in the last two and a half years. And he wouldn't wait until indictment number two on these facts, and he's still today keeping the report he mentioned somewhere, but he has not released this report that would refute all the allegations. So the reason why I bring that up to understand his thinking is that when you think about the threat that I think the former president is to the country, this is not an issue of nuance as to what he thinks about the election, in my view. It's not an issue of nuance as to whether this election was stolen. It's not an issue of nuance. This is just outright uh, a fraud that was perpetrated upon the American people by him and upon his supporters by him. And the people who went to defend the country, in their view, defend the country by attacking the Capitol, they also were defrauded because all of this was made up. Um, and so when I think is the country safer, I can't say the country safer because the threat that led these folks is still trying to gain uh, the highest um, 
uh, office in the land. And those sentiments that are, that are there, that drove the attack. I mean, to make people who see themselves as patriotic attack their own capital, um, to attack officers, to talk that they're going to kill members of Congress of their own party. Um, and one thing I just to, to, I think that highlights the unique threat of the former president, when all this is happening, we had a hearing called 187 minutes, and that is how long former President Trump sat and refused to say anything to the country about what was happening. And again, it's Republicans that told us what he did. And you can go watch the hearing where you can see the entire layup of the White House, Cassie Hutchinson, you can see what Mark Meadows said. You can read Mark Meadows' text messages, which again, are online. You can see him talking to Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram, and they're telling him, tell Trump to stop this. These are not Democrats talking. And this entire time, the former president does nothing. He refuses. He's told that they want to kill Mike Pence. His vice president, he says, no, he's not stopping them. Right? So 187, he's watching on television, all the attack happened. He's watching the hand-to-hand -hand combat that's happening against law enforcement, and he says, do nothing. Let them keep going. The first time he talks, he says positive words about uh, the insurrectionists. So I think if you were to imagine an American president watching his country under attack, people doing it in his name under what he knows is a lie, and when people are literally getting killed and trying to kill uh, other members of the government, he says, do nothing. And he only eventually, and this is where Ivanka is trying to talk him into doing something, they're all trying to, you have to stop this. Only you can stop this. And he says, no, he's not going to stop it. All while he knows it's based all on a lie. So if that individual is again seeking office and could win office potentially, I don't think you can say the country is safer because millions upon millions upon millions of people believe the last election was stolen and think that if he doesn't win this one, it'd be stolen again. Just add a, uh, just a comment, if I could. Um, Hitler's chief of propaganda made the statement, if you tell a big, a big enough lie long enough and you repeat it often enough, people will believe it. Now, I learned a lot here at Furman, but quite frankly, I didn't really understand the word narcissist. So after this was going on, I said, I better look that up. And the former president is the definition of a narcissist. He can do no wrong. And he's on mine. You, you both mentioned there's no evidence to support the claims he was making. Why didn't we hear that from other elected officials in his party? Those folks in the White House those folks in Congress that knew what the numbers said, why didn't we you, hear from you them? You were a professor of political science, right? I, I have my theory. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to well, that. I'm, I want your take it, first. There's this thing my called, students will tell you I do that to them too, by the way. There's this <laughs> thing called votes. And if, either even if you're telling a lie, but you've got this mass group of people that are believing it and supporting you, that's a lot of votes. So I might, I'll give the short answer. Our lawyer can give a more nuanced and informed answer. Uh, they're afraid of, they, they want positions of, continuing positions of power, maybe even someday to become the president, and they don't want to anger those votes. I think that's, that's the reason they haven't spoken. A few have, most haven't. Yeah, and we, we saw the same thing with people we would depose. I mean, we would depose them, and again, our evidence came almost exclusively from Republicans. And you would have people who would, you would ask them under oath, tell, tell me the, the proof. And they would, there was not a single person who I can remember that came in and answered substantive questions and had a substantive explanation for any of this, right? And um, so why did people not say that? You know, some of them did and they backtracked. You go look at, uh, Speaker McCarthy's words after the attack, he right away, first of all, he's calling the former president while the attack is happening, begging him to pull, call off the mob, because everyone knows who's in control of the mob. And afterwards, he says, it's Trump. He did it. 
Now, the political, th I think one thing the former president shows is the value of being shameless, because I think by virtue of him just not resigning the way you mentioned, you know, President Nixon, the fact that political ties, I think, shifted, folks saw the wins and that, you know, he wasn't going to go anywhere. But in private depositions, you would have people tell us that faulting to him, you would have people say, yeah, I personally didn't buy this stuff. And then the next day, I can think of one individual um, who the next day you see him, he's on, he's a press secretary for a Republican candidate who's making election fraud claims. And while he was just in a deposition, you know, lamenting that the former president didn't care about off the police officer that was killed that day, he didn't care. I mean, he's what he's saying, and again, these text messages that we, that we asked him about, he says this, are public. They were showed in the hearing. Um, so I think there's a real moral failure. And I don't say from political lens, but just watching what happened here, that uh, constantly you saw the disconnect between people who wrote, even people who wrote these fundraising claims that were all folded lies and asking them, why did you say this? And folks kind of had a, a shrug. I'm gonna follow up on what they said, just because I know some in our audience may be a little uncomfortable that our discussion tonight has focused primarily on Trump and Republicans. Um, and before I, wanna, before I ask the next question, I wanna provide some context and explanation for that focus. Going back to at least 2009, so way pre-Trump, political scientists were trying, who were trying to understand growing partisan polarization among the public noticed that there were a significant number of our fellow Americans who held authoritarian views. I'm not talking about a preference for dictatorship here. Do not get me wrong. I'm simply talking about people who basically said they would not mind if their leaders ignored the niceties of checks and balances in the name of protecting order and our way of life. And the other thing they noticed was these folks coming from a variety of parties were starting to gravitate toward the Republican Party in the 2000s. Um, more recently, research during and after the Trump presidency has shown that Republican members of Congress have been more likely than Democratic members of Congress to use anti-democratic rhetoric. My own research has focused on congressional communication following the 2020 election and on the day of January 6, and it showed Republican members often chose to remain silent rather than to, re rather than to directly confront the former president's efforts to undermine the legitimacy of the 2020 election, even when they knew his claims were false. Even those who condemned the violence on January 6 were reluctant to call it an insurrection or label it as a threat to democracy. And so that's part of why I think we're, we're focused a bit on Republicans. So I'm gonna ask one more question directly relevant to the Republicans and then expand it out a little bit. Admiral McConnell, you were a military officer. You noted that you had to swear an oath to support the Constitution. Right. Um, you dealt with presidents of both parties, but a lot of your time has been spent in Republican administrations. Mm -hmm. Um, and working in national intelligence um, in those areas. Having been on the inside of government in those Republican administrations, what do you think conservatives and Republicans, leaders and grassroots, need to do to preserve our democracy today and going forward? I think it's a matter of leadership and statesmanship. Um, the mem I, when I was most active, it was uh, Reagan, Bush, uh, Clinton, Bush again, and then Obama. And as long as I was around either of those groups, Republican or, or Democrat, uh, liberal or conservative, their focus was the country. Their focus was protecting the country and democratic institutions. Now they fussed at Congress and they were you know, upset they wouldn't pass a law or whatever like that whatever of that nature, but first and foremost, they always put the country first. Uh, so in my view, it's up to citizens first. Remember, we get exactly the government we choose because we put them there. So it's up to citizens first to make appropriate choices. 
But I also think it's up to national leaders to have a voice and to stand up and talk about what's right. So my plea to those leaders, influential people, would be to have a voice. Uh, I know both the President Bushes did speak up. Uh, older Bush was getting older and couldn't do as much. Younger Bush had a policy. He would never criticize an incumbent president. And he kept his quiet for a long time. He didn't, he didn't cry, criticize President Obama. He did start to speak up. He gave some rousing speeches, but it wasn't enough. The entire leadership across the political spectrum, I think, needs to have the courage and conviction to speak truth to power. One more question for... <laughs> One more question to specifically aim at, is there anything the Democrats need to be doing right now? Either, to me? One, of, either one of you. Um, uh, I didn't warn them that <laughs> question yes, was coming. I, remember, I'm an independent, so I can do this. He can't, but I can. Uh, my observation, and at least my feeling, is I have watched presidents, sometimes up close, campaign to the, from the right or campaign from the left. But what I observed them do mostly was move to the middle. They, they figured out a way to work with the Congress and satisfy the desires of, of the people. So Democrats have now a, an extremist wing of their own that have very strong views, and I think they need to mitigate those views to understand what's right for the most people and the country, and we generally work better when we're governing from the middle. I, I want to use, it's a terrible example, but I want to use it. We prevailed in World War II. We were the leader of the world. Uh, I mentioned my remarks. Uh, United Nations, NATO, International Monetary Fund, Bretton Woods set up the rules, and we were doing the right thing. Um, as a nation, we focused on deterring the Soviet Union. And we spoke with one voice, and we pulled in the same direction. And we prevailed. We don't have that kind of a threat today. It, we do, but most people aren't cognizant of it yet. It's China. China wants to replace the United States in the position that we've been privileged to, to have literally over the last century, but specifically after World War II. So that threat is there. It's not as visible, it's not talked about as much, but we need to come back as a nation and focus in a way on what's right for the nation as opposed to what's exactly right for any small individual group. So in my view, the Democrats have their, they're referred to as progressives or a variety of names. They could be pretty extreme. And I think we're better governed when we're governed from the middle. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Just something I want to say on that front though. I, I do think it is important. Um, I think because we're talking about an election and we're talking about a former president, there is an inclination to make it a political conversation. So I would push back and I would say, I don't think it, it's, it really is an appropriate question, a point, I think, of what Democrats have to do. Because the problem with the threat to democracy, and we're talking about that almost destroyed American democracy, that led the people dying, that, 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 that would have overturned the will of, 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 a, of a democratic election, did not come from the Democratic Party. So I say that, as we're thinking about what to do next, there are political discussions to be had that folks can debate, you know, how they feel about taxes or drag queens or whatever else they want to debate. And I think that is for the political realm. I think the question about American democracy, though, the challenge here is that you did see Republicans. I mean, we had two on our committee, and no one thinks Liz Cheney is any kind of liberal. Um, and Liz Cheney worked her heart out in defense of American democracy. And there was no discussion that anyone at the committee had with Liz Cheney about politics or any agreement, and no one on that committee, I think, you know, came closer who was not already on the right to being on the right because they worked with Liz Cheney, because the politics was a separate point. So I do think on this question of the threat to American democracy, we should put aside the question of 
I think our instinct is to go into like, what do both sides have to do? And it is possible that you have a problem that is uniquely on one side. And I think from everything we saw, this challenge and threat that we saw and uncovered and, and have disclosed to the country, it just didn't come from both sides. And I, I don't see any evidence of a corollary to this specific threat. And I think if we inject too much of a political conversation, it will diminish the unique threat that I think the former president has to American democracy. When he's 80 and more seasoned. <laughs> when he's 80 and more seasoned, he'll have a more moderate view. <laughs> I'm sure I will. <laughs> I, I'm going to throw my two cents in. As our Riley Institute advanced team members come out here with the questions, that's their cue to come out. Um, I, the reason I asked that question is because I think one of the things I've noticed in talking to some Democrats is they assume everyone already understands the magnitude of January 6th and what happened leading up to it. And I think that that's a danger. I think we need to recognize not everybody, not everybody around us is there yet. And I think it's conversations like this that actually help us understand the seriousness of the threat that we're, that we're facing in our country, in our democracy. That's why I had asked that. All right. We'll turn it over to your questions now for a few moments. Okay. So there were several questions on the role of intelligence agencies and their, impa and their impact on democracy. So we would like to ask you who your views on that was. Firstly, to what extent the events of January 6th be blamed on the failure of intelligence apparatus? Secondly, on a different note, how threatening are those agencies to our democracy if, they're, if they are also a risk? We are a nation of laws, and when we get the law right, the intel agencies will, by and large, you may have an exception around the margin, they'll abide by those laws. Let me use an example. J. Edgar Hoover was in charge of the FBI for, well, our pr previous FBI, what became the FBI, from the 20s to 1972. He was tapping the telephone of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And he was tapping the telephone of uh, uh, Justice Hugo Black. The reason for that, he said, they're subversives because they were deciding the case brought here in South Carolina of uh, Brown versus the uh, state of South Carolina about uh, segregation. J. Edgar Hoover used the FBI in very abusive ways to spy on America, Americans, uh, throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. When President Nixon was in office, he harnessed that community to include CIA and my agency, NSA, and so on, because of the protests about Vietnam, it was justified as, well, those protesters can't be good Americans. And so commander in chief said, go do these things, so they did. Uh, they didn't push back. Nixon was about to be impeached, he left, and then the Congress, uh, and two committees, the Church Committee in the Senate and the Pike Committee in the, in the House, turned my community inside out. And the result was something, it's a strange acronym. I don't like acronyms, but I'll tell it to you and then I'll tell you what it stands for. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. And it's in the press now because we've got to redo it, and so it's, it's a part of the discussion. But it basically said, to conduct your foreign intelligence mission, even change the name of the budget to foreign intelligence budget, you can conduct surveillance on foreigners, Soviet Union, or uh, Middle East, whoever was a problem for us. But you cannot and you shall not conduct surveillance of Americans. Now, then the question, well, what happens, you know, United Nations in New York City, what happens when there are foreigners there? If you're going to tap a phone in, of a foreigner in this country, you have to have a warrant. Now, that set up a little bit of an issue. It worked fine. Didn't happen to have many warrants. The NSA was never turned down on a warrant because all you had to do was... Uh, uh, agent of foreign power. And so it was pretty straightforward. Well, then we had this thing called 9-11, and we had this thing called the Internet. So we got a terrorist in Pakistan directing a terrorist in Turkey to blow up a U.S. facility in Germany. It's a foreigner talking to a foreigner 
attacking U.S. interests. Where do we access that information? California. If you looked at a map of the internet in those days, 90% of all email in the world went through the United States. So all these terrorists were using free email to coordinate their operations. So we had to revise FISA. Rather than have a warrant for a foreigner talking to a foreigner, why should we be restricted about where we collect it? It's called 702. That's up for renewal. It's going to be a big debate. But that was a, as D and I, my predecessor did it, worked it for a year. I did it for a couple of years, and we finally got it through the Congress. So this terrorist I was mentioning had uh, 200 email accounts. A warrant's longer than my speech. And uh, it took a lot of time. We couldn't keep up. So once we had authorization, we could cause the email companies to allow us to access communications of a foreigner to another foreigner in a foreign country. So the answer to your question, are we a threat always? Never trust us. <laughs> when I say that, it, anything unchecked will do harm. And so we have these things called oversight committees. And I can tell you, I've been wire brushed by the best of them. And so as long as we have oversight, we have laws, and when there are mistakes, you can modify the law to address the mistake. Uh, Intel communities aren't going to be a threat to this company. They're loyal Americans. They take that oath. They believe it. I'll, I'll tell you something that will surprise this audience. The best protector of your rights to privacy are the employees of the National Security Agency. Because we have rules, and if one of the employees breaks the rules, even by mistake, they will turn that person in, and the director has to go down and see the attorney general to make a report. So they are very, very focused and sensitive on not breaking the rules. Is there an occasional lapse? Sure. When you find it, you deal with it, and you move on. But as a society, you get the law right, you have appropriate oversight, and then the U.S. intelligence community is not a threat to this country. As a matter of fact, it does great work. I'll use my last example. I know we're running long. i just tell you this. We figured out how to break Germany codes in World War II. We've never had an intel community ever. We're always flat-footed, so we, we got a problem. We built it. We kept one after World War II because of the Cold War. But we figured out with the British how to break German codes. So we were reading their mail before they were going to do whatever they're going to do. And when we had deception and trying to fool them, we could see if it was working. Churchill at the end said, breaking codes saved 12 million lives and shortened the war by two years. Now, the code breaker that did that turned out to be homosexual. He got arrested because it was not legal in Britain, and they chemically castrated him. And he assassinated himself, or he uh, committed suicide as a result. It's a wonderful movie. The man's name is Alan Turing. Everybody in this audience should watch it. This question is for Mr. Agango Williams. Have you encountered anyone that has disagreed with the findings and facts of the investigative committee? And what would you say to them? So have I encountered? Yes, have you encountered anyone, and what would you say to them? Well, I, I, I live in New York City, so no. But, <laughs> um, um, you know, I think there, I'm sure there, there are a lot of people who disagree with the findings. I mean, there are probably people here today who disagree with the findings. And what I would say to them is what I said before. This was an open investigation, right? This is not an investigation that we came back to the American people and said, believe us. Right, we basically put a trial on television, right? We had all our hearings and laid out the evidence in extreme detail. We put our evidence on the internet, and it's still on the internet. You can Google it when you leave here tonight. So to those who I think don't buy what we're saying, I would say just, I would ask you, implore you to give, to give this an open look. And I think I understand why it's difficult because I have my political positions. I have my president that I love. And, you know, I, that you come with the presumption of they, they're doing good and that they are working for the country. And there's a reason why you support them and you love them and 
all that. And if someone said they were not that, that would be difficult to digest. So I, I fully appreciate that. Uh, but I would say that I, I do think it's a call to patriotism. I think it's a call to love of country. Um, because I think the question facing a lot of people is, it, what is at the top? Is it the country or is it a man? And if it's the country and it's patriotism, then the analysis of what that man did should be done with an open mind as much as possible. And if it turns out that that man acted against the country you love, then that's a lesson for you of what you should do next. And when you think about your votes and you think about your financial support and you think about what you tell your family members. So I would just, I would just again, I think an open mind would lead people to conclude um, that former President Trump lied, that he was the one who was engaged in a fraud, that he tried to overturn an election, that he already had lost by seven million votes. And frankly, there just, there was not widespread fraud that impacted the election results. And that, and that has been found by everyone independent who looked at it, found by his own Department of Justice, um, found by his own campaign, did this search, um, and told everyone that there was no fraud. His own campaign, and we, I've seen the emails, we've deposed these people, we've talked to them. Uh, and to the extent that you don't believe that, then I would say go dive into the details. You think there was fraud, go look up whatever fraud you think there was and read the counter narrative on that point. And I think you'll see that uh, there's not support for that. And I think if, once you conclude that, then you should act uh, in the ballot box the same way. Jackie, do we have time for one more? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, excellent. Let's get on. Okay, we also received a large number of questions on the future of our democracy, especially with regards to electoral fraud, extremism, and Trump's ability to run in elections. So even if Trump is barred from running for office, how would Trump's legacy continue to affect democracy? Also, in the case that Trump is not convicted, what happens if Trump wins? This is when I love being the moderator. I don't have to answer that question. Gentlemen. <laughs> Well, if Trump wins, I'm going to look for a visa to go to Canada. <laughs> and I say that half jokingly, but um, this is incriminating if you have Trump's point of view. And this is public. You, are you all recording, right? So this will be made. So I'll be, in, I'll be public enemy number at least top 10. So uh, I think I would uh, think about other courses of action. Over to my colleague. Um, <laughs> so I think the question was, what happens if, if Trump wins, right? And, was there a first and what point? happens, what, I mean, what's the legacy? Even if he doesn't win, does this continue to affect the next election? You know, I think probably yes. But, you know, I think when I look at American history, and, you know, I'm a naturalized citizen, and uh, moved here when I was 10. And I look at American history and I see a pretty dark history in a lot of America and a lot of positives, right? So I think if you look and you see that America has a pretty tumultuous history, both in the good and also lots of bad that America has done, I think you have a more nuanced view of America, but you also have a lot of hope in America because you're driven by the idealism and not because you believe a rosy picture of what was and therefore what happened in the past will always be. I think, you know, when I look at the civil rights leaders of the 60s, you know, what they're fighting for is in America, they're saying, they're demanding America live up to its ideals. So their love of America is not looking backwards at some magical time where America was great. They're saying that the greatness is still ahead. So I think the legacy, the, probably the legacy of, I think, Trump will be this remnant of, frankly, I think, looking at, down on America. And I think, there's, I think there's going to be a legacy, and I think what people have to do is to adopt that same kind of civil rights approach, which is the best of America is the future. And I think that's, I don't have a better answer than that. Uh, but I am also heartened by the fact that he lost the last election, right? So, you know, doesn't mean he, he, he will lose the next one, but he lost the last one. Seven million more people said no to his brand of politics. Um, and 
the last midterms didn't go well for that brand of politics. And I think, you know, if he were to win, you know, I, I, I don't think you can overstate the danger that I think the country would face with a president that, uh, with a long list of enemies, with vengeance on his heart, um, with no political concerns about a, another term in office, um, I think it would be incredibly dangerous. But I think, you know, rather than focusing on that, I think we have very able prosecutors doing what prosecutors are across. I was a prosecutor, what they do every day, which is follow the facts and prosecute people for their crimes. And I think there's going to be the jury of the American people who will have to render judgment as well. And uh, let's just say I have faith in, in both juries. May I, may I add a, just a yes, follow-on comment? I, sure. I want to associate myself with the comments you just made. I thought they were wonderful. I, one of the things I want to highlight in this darker days of America, we fought a civil war to preserve slavery, and or by some, but some disagreed. Uh, most people may not understand it or appreciate it. We lost more people to casualties in the civil war than every war we've ever been involved in before combined. It was a dark time. And the president led us through that, was assassinated. And then it became a dark time, particularly in the South and particularly for black people. But we did come through that. And there's a, I don't want to sound Pollyannish, but there's an element of hope in me because every time I go back to read what the founders are trying to create is don't let a demagogue rule, checks and balances, oversight, and, all, and then I got to live it. So I've got, I'm in the Navy, we're doing spooky things, and we want to do it our way, and the Congress says, wait a minute, what are you doing? Wait, how, who, by whose authority? Do you? Those are good questions, and that system generally prevails. I think it was perverted in what led up to 6 January, but I have great faith that we're going to write and get back on the right path. I sure hope so. They guessed my last question, which was, what gives you hope? Anything you want to add to that? Or did that cover it? You know, I think there's been a lot of attack on American institutions. And I think when I look at the story of January 6th, former President Trump attacked every just about every institution that you could find, and they all made it through. It doesn't mean they'll make it through in the future, but the courts render judgment, 61 out of 62 cases lost. The one case he won was trivial, didn't impact anything. Uh, Department of Justice, you have my former boss, Rich Donahue, you had folks who said they would resign, and they would, again, all Republicans who stood up to him and stopped him. You had uh, state officials, we have one coming next week, um, right, who's, who are true and true Republicans and are as conservative as anyone else, and they stood up to the pressure uh, coming from the president, from senators, Lindsey Graham, and, and, and whatnot. You have poll workers that were attacked, you know, in Fulton County, they were lied, they were said to be doing the suitcase full of ballots, and that was all false. So a lot of people were the victims of what happened, including Capitol Police officers. You had those that died, you know, that, the one that died that day and the several that died in the days after. Um, and people who were physically injured, but a lot of people still stood up to the threat. So I think what gives me hope is not that these institutions are, you know, beyond destruction, but that they did have ability to take a kind of beating and that individuals who felt a lot of pressure and honestly had a lot of incentive to go the easier route did it, including the vice president. So I think it, it doesn't, it's not a guarantee for the future, but it gives me hope looking back that, that there is, even, you know, even on the, on the Republican Party that's having the same kind of issues, there is still that strand, I think, that is, that is uh, frankly, pro-America above anything else. And I'm, you know, I'm hoping that that continues. As Timmy Dio has mentioned, uh, we continue this discussion next week on Wednesday, not Tuesday at 6.30 with Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia Secretary of State who received that phone call from President Trump asking for a few extra votes. 
Uh, we will also have joining him Larry Norden, an election security and integrity expert from the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University School of Law. So we'll be here same time next week, 6.30, different day on Wednesday. I hope you will be able to join us then. Thank you, gentlemen, for a Thank wonderful you. discussion. Thank you. Have a good evening.